Uh, this is a thyroid basically situated in the neck and it's located around the trachea and it consists basically of two important cell groups. One of course is an endocrine, is a typical adenomatous endocrine cell, the follicular cells which <coughs> develop uh, embryonically from a different kind of tissue and are ultimately responsible in secreting the thyroxine or the thyroid hormone. And then there is another completely discordant group of cells which sits anatomically in the thyroid but has nothing actually to do with thyroid development. It comes from an entirely different set of organs. It comes from the neuroendocrine tissue and that's the calcitonin or the parafollicular C cells. When I talk about thyroid today, I'm going to restrict myself to the follicular adenomas, or, or I'm sorry, the follicular cells which secrete the thyroxine. And these are the follicles as you can see them which are lined by the follicular cells and all this tissue inside is the colloid or the thyroglobulin which actually stores the thyroid hormone inside the thyroid cell. If you look at some of the basic physiology, this is calcitonin and as I said I'm not going to discuss calcitonin. Calcitonin becomes important only in medullary cancer of the thyroid which is a separate topic and we are not going to go into that today. But if you look at the thyroid hormones, you know that thyroid have a myriad number of functions and they can affect each and every metabolic process inside the body, whether it is transcription of large number of genes, whether it is increasing the cellular metabolic activity, whether it is growth both in the intrauterine and the extrauterine period, whether it is the development of puberty, whether it is carbohydrate metabolism, fat metabolism, vitamin metabolism, all of them are typically affected by thyroid and hence the typical symptomatology of thyroid will not af only affect just the neck but a multiple system involvement is seen and the lab tests apart from the thyroid will also include problems of the glucose metabolism. They will also show changes in the fat metabolism. Typically therefore you will have ha uh, high cholesterol in hypothyroidism and a low cholesterol in thyrotoxicosis. You will have a depletion of enzymes, typically when there is severe thyrotoxicosis, typically the B12 group. Carbohydrate intolerance is very well known in people who have hyperthyroidism and so is hypoglycemia known, particularly in diabetics who develop hypothyroidism newly, typically the type 1 diabetics. So Apart from the usual thyroid symptoms, a number of other endocrine processes are also involved in thyroid um, actions. If you look at the method in which the thyroid hormone synthesis takes place, the reason for bringing this slide will become a little clearer where we talk particularly about antibodies and their relevance in testing. Now this is basically the thyroid tissue. You have the capillaries on one side where, from where the iodine actually is going to enter the thyroid cell and this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum where thyroglobulin is actually synthesized and discharged into the follicle lumen which is this is the entire follicle lumen here. Iodine actually comes inside. It is actively trapped inside the thyroid gland. It is then converted by oxidation to the active form of iodine and this iodine will then get incorporated into the thyroid follicular lumen where it combines with tyrosine which is present in the thyroglobulin and then forms the hormone monoidotyrosine which contains a single iodine atom and by a variety of combinations you will get hormones which have either four or three iodine atoms thereby known as T4 or T3 respectively. So it is this entire process which is happening inside the thyroid follicular lumen inside the thyroglobulin. So you have a process of active trapping of the iodine, oxidation of the iodine and incorporation of these iodine into the tyrosine residues to form monoidotyrosine and diiodotyrosine and these then are stored inside the lysosomes which when required are then released to the periphery and this is the entire way in which uh, the thyroid hormone synthesis occurs. The relevance of this to pathologists is that when we are checking antibodies. Antibodies are typically, most of them, directed against one of these mechanisms. So they could be directed against active iodine trapping. These are called the symporter antibodies or they could be 
directed against the peroxidation of iodine, which occurs inside the cell. These are the antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. And there could be antibodies directed against the thyroglobulin binding to the iodine residues. These are the antithyroglobulin antibodies, and so on and so forth. So basically, what we are doing here by checking antibodies is we are checking antibodies to different important processes involved in the synthesis of the thyroid gland. Now, this is where the T3 and T4 is actually released into the peripheral tissues. This is how the production will then occur. Now, when we are looking at T3 and T4, one must importantly remember that the primary secretion from thyroid is only the T4. T3 is not primarily secreted by the gland. And in fact, therefore, although T3 is a metabolically active hormone, the secretion of thyroid is primarily T4, except in hyperthyroidism, where T3 could be produced in excess to T4. So what T thyroid produces typically is T4, whereas the T3 is derived from two processes. Typically, it occurs from the deiodination of T4 in peripheral tissues. Now, this process is important to understand because a large number of processes will actually affect this deiodination process of T4 to T3 in the periphery. Therefore, the T3 hormone, which is neither directly secreted by the thyroid and is dependent on a large number of factors for its conversion from T4 is a hormone which is fraught with a lot of difficulty in interpretation. Therefore, the relevance of T3 in testing actually is going down because it neither tells you the directly the functioning of the thyroid and it is also influenced by so many non-thyroidal factors that to interpret T3 alone is very difficult. Therefore, the prime importance still remains of testing T4 along with TSH. This is the importance of what is produced inside the liver. The main uh, extrathyroidal organ which causes this conversion is the liver. And therefore, obviously, if there is a liver dysfunction, you get, could get a lot of problems in T4 to T3 conversion. And of course, kidney and other tissues also contribute. Now, the, there are three important enzymes which are involved in this process of deiodination of the T4 hormone. And these are labeled as D1, D2, and D3, deiodinases 1, 2, and 3. Now, 1 and 2 are actually involved in the activation of the hormone. That means they will convert T4 to T3. That means they bioactivate the hormone, whereas D3, that is the deiodinase 3, actually deactivates the thyroid hormone. And this is often present in the placenta in pregnancy and that is one of the reasons why there is extra requirement or there is a state of hypothyroidism which is being produced in pregnancy. So people who are hitherto on the borderline, when they become pregnant, there is an increased destruction of T4 in the periphery by the type 3 deiodinase in the placenta, therefore causing more stress on the thyroid gland and therefore people who sit on the border can suddenly become hypothyroid when they get pregnant. So this is the importance of these deiodinases. As I said, there is the most of the conversion of T4, the metabolic fate of T4 is to T T3, but there is something also which is formed and that is called reverse T3. So T4 can get converted either to T3 or something called reverse T3. 